All right, it looks like I, I have to look and make sure, but it looks like we're on. Uh, good afternoon. This is uh, the Book of the Month Bible Study that we do every Tuesday at 2 if we can stay on schedule. All right, so this is the Book of the Month Bible Study. I'm Pastor Kevin Yoakum from Christ the King Lutheran Church right here in gorgeous Florida. Just absolutely wonderful uh, day today, and we want to enjoy every day that the Lord has given us. Uh, so, as the book of the month Bible study, what book are we doing this month, Pastor? Well, I'll tell you. We're doing Revelation, and this is the 29th of the month, so this will be our last chapter in Revelation this month. And then, like we do, a book of the month, we'll go back to John. John, uh, around chapter 17 or 18 or something like that next week and uh, so book of the month so that means April May we'll get back to Revelation and keep going on with it okay but uh, oh boy uh, do we have something to talk about today all right so let's begin with a word of prayer dear Heavenly Father we thank you that you give us your word the scriptures the Bible the very word and message of Jesus Christ given for us and for our salvation so we ask you to enlighten us today and, and cause us to receive uh, this word given for us uh, with joy and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so good afternoon, if if you're watching in the afternoon. I'm not going to make you. If you're watching it at night, you can, you can keep watching. All right, uh, but good afternoon is what I'm going to say. And... Um, we are in Revelation chapter 8. Now it goes, uh, it, we had a really nice chapter last week. Uh, it was nice and friendly and it gets tougher this week. So um, we could say, can we just go home and not talk about it? But no, this is the scriptures. Let's understand. And if you say that's a really tough chapter, well just remember, let's keep everything in context. Uh, we don't just say, oh, Revelation 8 was terrible. But let's remember Revelation 7 and see where we're going to go with the other chapters as well. So we don't just say Revelation, the whole book is all bad. No, it's actually a word of comfort to many people who are suffering, to Christians who are suffering, that they can see the victory promised in Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, so we could kind of ask, are, are, we, are we suffering? Are, are Christians suffering today? And um, I think... Throughout all the ages, Christians have found comfort in the book of Revelation. So, uh, all right, so let's put this in context here, right? Remember, Revelation is the vision given to St. John, John the Apostle. And uh, the first, the first, well, the first chapter is the introduction. Chapters 2 and 3 are the uh, chapters on the message that is given to each of the seven churches of Asia Minor, the seven churches, Ephesus, and the, the towns surrounding it. And then chapter four, you get to see the uh, Jesus entry into heaven after the ascension is uh, how we see that. And uh, so Jesus entry into the uh, into heaven and uh, the in the fifth chapter, they say, oh, you know, praise, as they're praising Jesus, they also say, who is worthy to open the scroll? And here comes Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who is worthy, who he alone is worthy to open the scroll. So in chapter 6, he opens the scroll. There's seven seals along the scroll. Not uh, seals like porpoises, uh, but seal, <laughs> seals like, you know, wax seals to seal the letter. So... Uh, he breaks each seal, and with each seal, something happens, right? Uh, and the four horsemen are released upon the earth. Uh, the, four horsemen of, uh, the four horsemen, tyranny and bloodshed and pestilence and death, or plague and death, or things like that. Um, and, and so the four horsemen of the apocalypse uh, bring, show that these things are out in the world. And uh, last week we talked about the different ways you can look at Revelation, like when are these things fulfilled? And we just mentioned that academically, uh, there's the preterist view, the historicist view, the futurist view, or the idealist view. And the preterist view says all these things took place probably in the first hundred years um, after the book was written. 
the historicist view says that these things are slowly being fulfilled throughout time. The futurist view looks forward, maybe even past us, and says uh, they haven't been fulfilled yet, but they will be fulfilled in some later dispensation or something like that, maybe. Uh, and the idealist view says we think that these things are happening throughout time. At every time, you can see some of these either victories of God, some of these persecutions happening upon the church, or whatever. And so, um, now as I said, I was honest that uh, I tend to the idealist view myself, but that the the book, the book, the book, the book, uh, uh, the commentary on Reformation or on uh, Revelation, the Reformation Heritage Bible Commentary, written by Mark Brighton, uh, it it says. We're not going to hold to a view. We're going to read the scriptures, and uh, the scriptures will present their meaning, uh, whether we want them to be idealist or historicist or futurist or whatever, right? Which is fair, right? I tend to say, well, maybe I'm more in the idealist camp. But rather than make Revelation fit my views, I should get my views from Revelation. See what I mean? Okay, all right. Now... We only have 13 chapters to go. So it, if you don't ask any questions, I'll keep going and hopefully we'll get done in a shorter amount of time, right? Some of these are an hour long and I try to not go any longer than an hour. But if we can uh, keep it shorter, what's, what's wrong with that, right? Now I did hear someone joke one time, short passage, long sermon. <laughs> That's not my philosophy. All right. I, I try, if I can, to say what I need to say and then stop saying. All right, so, Pastor, be quiet and get on with your teaching, right? All right. We come to Revelation chapter 8. In chapter 6, we got through six of the seven seals. And then in chapter 7 was this interlude where no seals of the seven seals were opened. And it was like... Uh, before we go on, let's remind ourselves how good God is, that he grants salvation and victory to his people through Jesus Christ. So chapter 7 was like a, a needed pause to shore up uh, maybe our faith to say we see the promises of God and we see how good he is and we see that he hears our prayers. So then chapter 8 we get to the seventh seal, okay? Chapter 8, verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stood before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Okay. Woo. All right. So... Here we get to the seventh seal. When the Lamb opens the seventh seal, I picture, you know, I'm, we don't use wax seals that often, at least that I, that I use, right? Um, but I picture, you know, kind of breaking that wax so that the paper can unscroll, right? The scroll. When the Lamb opens the seventh seal, it says there was silence in heaven. All right, now for half an hour, we'll get to that. I don't really think it means much, but uh, no, I'm not trying to say the Bible's not important. That's not what I'm saying. But let's get to the silence. Why would there be silence uh, where when they break open the seal? Well, there has been so many other things. There's been the six seals that brought these things happening, and the four horsemen of apocalypse. And then in the the little interlude, it was not a quiet interlude in chapter seven. It was songs of praise to Jesus Christ, to the Lamb, and to the Father. And so now, when there is the seventh seal, it's this anticipation, right? 
Um, it's not like there was silence like, oh, well. No, it's the, it's the growing anticipation of silence. And this is a time where you are silent before God, like what is going to happen? And, and the commentary helped me, you know, reminded me, showed me the connection that uh, even in the book of Zephaniah and other places, but it pointed out Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 7 will say, Be silent before the Lord God. The day of the Lord is near. All right? So this is the silence that happens in anticipation. In anticipation, this is the silence that happens when you're like, "Here it comes!" Right? So for some people, it's the silence before of you know in sports before a free throw. In some, you know, it's the silence that happens at the near the end of the game. They think, right? When the, how what's that play going to look like? It could be the last play, you know. It could be uh, the silence of that ninth inning, third batter, right? It could be that kind of a silence, but uh, but it's this silence. But this is also more worshipful than just a silly sports game, right? This is God is at work, and be silent before the Lord. It's even been mentioned in the scriptures in the Old Testament, Zephaniah 1. Be silent before the Lord God. The day of the Lord is near. So there's times for silence, and it's good because you're waiting on God to do his thing, okay, to be at work. And they know this is the sixth seal. This Now once we get the seventh seal open, what happens then, right? So uh, there was silence. And then it says there were seven angels who stood before God. And seven trumpets were given to them. Now we have the horn section. <laughs> okay, pardon me. So remember, we had seven seals. Now we have seven trumpets. And before we had seven churches. And let me just tell you, we're going to have seven bowls later. You can see the number seven at work. Now. This is not the lottery. This is not the casino. Look at number seven. Seven is God's number in the scriptures. Okay? So this is God at work. And so the seven angels are there. Now, I'm not going to make too much of this, but the, the Jewish literature between the Old Testament and the New Testament, they call that intertestamental Jewish literature, um, has seven angels who are named. Now, I'm not going to name them all, but two of them, I don't know the names of all of them, two of them are going to be Gabriel and, uh, oh, now I forget, uh, see, the other one, uh, the other one that is named in the rest of Scripture, but one of them is Gabriel, right, Michael, I think it's Michael, all right, yeah, Michael and Gabriel. Uh, so though it's interesting too that in the this Jewish literature there are seven angels that have names. Now, can I make anything out of that? No, I really can't because for one reason, I, I'm not the master of intertestamental Jewish literature, and uh, we, you know, I focus on what I believe to be scripture. So nothing against intertestamental Jewish literature. Um, but I don't know that I can say there is a connection or isn't. But when you say seven angels, some people will go, oh, it's like that, the intertestamental Jewish literature, right? <laughs> um, uh, apparently, first Enoch is what it is. I'm looking at my footnotes here. All right. So uh, the seven angels take up the seven trumpets. Like I said, here we have the heavenly horn section. <laughs> and... Um, and then another angel comes to the altar with a golden censer, uh, a thing that you wave around that has burning incense in it. So it puts out perfumed aromatic smoke, right? Fumes, right? So let me just, because if you're like me and you don't burn incense even at home to make things pretty, maybe your wife lights a candle that smells like cinnamon spice or something. but. Incense, you know, uh, some people do that to kind of arom make their room aromatic. Or churches still do this today, some churches. And so generally, the more liturgical you are, you might be more likely to do this 
is they will put incense in their worship service and it goes all the way back to the Old Testament so if you see if for instance you see a Greek Orthodox Church or a Roman Catholic Church or sometimes a Lutheran Church and there's someone swinging this little golden thing on a chain and it's smoking and they're going around like this they're putting the smell and the aroma of incense out throughout the sanctuary and you go why well in the Old Testament is why we see this because in the Old Testament there was always the golden altar of incense and so there was supposed to be incense burning every day in there to represent the prayers of the people the incense and the smoke and the aroma of arising before God as a pleasing aroma uh, and so first no, no, no. Uh, Psalms, uh, Psalm 141, I think it is. Let my prayers rise before you as incense, the lifting up of the evening sacrifice. So let, you know, kind of like let the incense represent my prayers and let my prayers be represented in the incense, you know, rising up to God as a pleasing aromatic sac uh, sacrifice, uh, you know, as a pleasing thing. Uh, and so the Old Testament will say has a sweet pleasing aroma just to think that God receives our prayers like a wonderful smell now what's a wonderful smell for you I know we're all going to be different right uh, when it get to those candles the cinnamon spice or whatever I don't like the ones that smell like vegetables I don't like the ones that smell like a flower or like the salt water in the waves or something like that. I like the ones that smell fruity. <laughs> I like the ones that smell like a cookie, right? So everybody has a different aroma. Maybe what's your, someone asked me one time, what's one of the most powerful smells uh, you can think of? And I thought of fried chicken. Fried chicken has a certain smell. And if you like fried chicken, it smells delicious, right? And, and so that smell, I know it's grease, but just, you know, what's a pleasing smell? And so the incense, God tells us in the Old Testament, it, he says this is a pleasing aroma to represent their prayers. And also, as you see the incense, it can be a reminder that we should pray and that God wants us to pray so that he can receive our prayers as a pleasing thing to him. Okay, so here the angel in heaven, in the, the heavenly temple, uh, we can say is, uh, he's giving much incense to offer up and this is the swinging. This is the hand motion that will create the swinging. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, swinging the incense around to fill it with, uh, with a, a wonderful smell to offer with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne of God. Okay? And the smoke of the incense filled um, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers rose before God from the hand of the angel. That's what it says. So we can we see there the, the connection between the incense and the prayers coming before God. And he's receiving that. Right? But then it says, verse 5, everything changes. Then the incense, the angel takes the censer and fills it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. I imagine, you know, the hot coals, the, the burning coals is what I imagine the fire is, but maybe fire from the altar and throws it on the earth. So uh, um, now it changes. There's the seventh seal is going to look like God is going to allow there to be judgment on the earth. And what is it? Peals of thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning, and an earthquake. Um, why all four? I don't know. Uh, but I mean, is there a number in the four things? I don't know. But the four uh, things, the thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning, and an earthquake are representing, you know, God's going to allow his judgment to come upon the earth. Now, if we struggle with the fact that God is a judging God, we really kind of struggle with a lot of the Bible, right? God sends forth his wrath and judgment at times in the Bible. Now, uh, we see, especially in the book of Re Revelation, God's divine judgment, you know, judgment coming from God, never comes to the faithful. We talked about last week, those who have had the seal, 
the mark on their forehead that, that uh, the angels would know who belonged to God, right? So uh, we're going to see through all of this that those who are faithful, those who have the seal or the mark uh, that show that they are gods, uh, God's people, they never receive the divine judgment. So this judgment that's coming upon the earth may affect people, but it will never uh, uh, bring down, uh, God will spare his people, all right? So, but there is sometimes judgment that must come to people uh, in on earth or before the Lord, right? I'm not going to deny that God also is a God of justice, and there's much injustice in the world. And so the scriptures are very clear that God will bring justice to the unrighteous. Okay? All right. So we, we're good with that. Uh, I still have no viewers. But that's okay. Um, all right. So, and this is what we're going to see in the seven trumpets. So the seventh seal opens. And really the seventh seal is showing that there's more to come with the seven trumpets and the trumpets will blast their announcement and something will happen right now uh when else do we see trumpets in the bible i can only think of two now i'm sure there's lots but i i can think of two specifically one is that we're told that when jesus comes back on the last day for the final judgment the trumpet will sound, right? When the last trump sounds, we sometimes hear an old English way of talking. Uh, all right, but and maybe another one that is more familiar to you is the story of Jericho, Joshua and the battle of Jericho and the walls of Jericho. And the Lord has Joshua, uh, you know, do these things and march around Jericho and the people, the, the priests were blowing their trumpets. They're, uh, Shofar, their ram's horn trumpets, I believe, at that time. But they're blowing their trumpets, ba ba ba, whatever sound they made, and that represented that God was coming for His people to bring judgment on Jericho, right? And so the final time, really, the the Israelites did not fight the battle of Jericho so much as they announced with trumpets that God would fight for Jericho, okay? Uh, all right, so you, they, then the Israelites have to clean up. <laughs> all right, but uh, so the seven trumpets are now going to start being sounded, all right? So verse six is its own paragraph. I try to take these a paragraph at a time. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. Wet your lips, you trumpeters. Get your breath uh, regulated and get ready to blow the trumpets, right? Um, I, if you've had any musical instrument uh, background, you know you get ready to play, right? So the angels are maybe getting the proper stance, getting their breath right, you know, or, or centering their mind on that they are doing a, a, a serious but noble task for the Lord, right? Sometimes you think about what's the meaning of what's happening here, but they prepare to blow the trumpet. So verse 7 is the next paragraph. The first angel blew his trumpet, blah, 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 and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. All right, so the first trumpet blows, and I have no idea if that is a good thing for a trumpet. Uh, the first trumpet blows, and there is hail and fire and blood. Uh, we, we see these phrases sometimes in, in uh, uh, music or literature or movies. Where people are talking about hail fire or blood fire or uh, fire and brimstone or something like that, right? Um, uh, but this is what happens. The angel blows and hail fire and uh, mixed with blood. Ooh. So uh, bloody hail, bloody fire, bloody brimstone. I don't know. Uh, these are thrown down upon the earth. 
So you get to see this is a very serious thing. These are thrown down upon the earth. Now, here's the, the thing. So some judgment from the Lord comes. And what it is, uh, some, so some people have said it means this and this and this, right? It means nuclear holocaust and it means... Uh, what you know uh, missiles from the sky and it means some sort of sickness that brings blood uh, others will say we see God's judgment coming right uh, and I'm not trying to wash away the scriptures but this might be where uh, a dispensationalist or someone with a different view has one idea to say it is literally these things you know I've heard some people say those are the Apache helicopters right uh, the locusts flying, uh, which we'll see later on in Revelation. So some people have said, see, that's an, an Apache helicopter. Well, if it's a nuclear missile or an Apache helicopter or something, which only came about in the 20th, 20th century, and what did those points in Scripture that have that image mean before the 20th century? See, that's a kind of a challenge for the futurist view is to say, well, if it's only made clear in the 20th century what this means, then that scripture must not have meant anything. Or it was never understood correctly for 2,000 years. And now that we have Apache helicopters or, or nuclear missiles, now we can understand it. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that this meant something to every generation. Not that the meaning of scripture changed, but that see again maybe the idealist I think that this means the same thing that there is this suffering from God that comes upon the earth uh, it may be in the form of meteors or maybe exactly what it is hail fire and blood uh, right but so then the next question is the third a third of the earth right um, a third of the earth a third of the trees and all the grass right um, and all the grass and, and, and so uh, there are some who are going to say it's a third, it's not a fourth, and it's not a fifth, and it's not a half. It's a third, right? And, and so some are kind of look, looking at that, well, oh, that's how he's portioned it, a third. Well, another way to look at it is in the Old Testament, when God prophesied, prophesied judgment and wrath, he would talk about how a third will be damaged and a third... Uh, will be damaged and so that maybe this is not about the um, measuring excuse me the measuring cup or the measuring line to know was it a third a fifth was it 33.33 percent or was it 35 percent or 25 percent right but maybe that third means divine judgment just like in the old testament when god said i'm going to come upon you and a third of you will be wiped out um, maybe we weren't really saying, well, how many is a third? Because you're just hearing judgments coming from God. And, and so a third might mean judgments coming from God, right? The, the hail and fire mixed with blood and God will bring judgment and there will be a third, you know, a, a divine number wiped out, right? You know, God's choosing. So I'm not trying to uh, wash away uh an ability to say this is literally what it means but what I'm trying to say is maybe it as a vision as an apocalyptic vision is not meant to be a literal percentage you know fraction but it's supposed to represent just like in the Old Testament a third meant God's judgment came uh, a third means here maybe it's just God's judgment right so uh, hopefully uh, you're with me in saying it's not that I'm trying to reframe the scriptures, but I'm trying to see if the Old Testament gives us an understanding of this, right? All right, that's verse 7. Verse 8, the second angel blows his trumpet, blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. All right, so the second angel blows his trumpet. And what do we have here in verse 8? Something like a mountain burning with fire throws into the sea. You know, with all of our movies these days and with all of our telescopes, we wonder, is this a giant meteor? 
you know so we I, well whatever it is this great big thing that comes turns the sea into blood now where else in the Bible have we heard that water turned to blood not wine all right hold on to the wine um, but water turned to blood that's right good answer uh, the uh, Exodus story in the book of Exodus where the water of the Nile River turned to blood in Egypt and this was one of the plagues one of the judgments that came to the people of Egypt because Pharaoh had enslaved the Israelites and he refused to let them go actually even the punishment for slavery would have been you know you read that story it's like that's in the past but now I'm telling you to let them go and all the judgments came because he would not allow now for them to be free right okay so um, so the sea turns to blood and that's going to bring up more Old Testament images wow it's like that uh, image from uh, the book of Exodus and there were creatures that died a third of the living creatures in the sea died well right uh, there was they were unable to live if there's blood and not water right and a third of the ships were destroyed uh, so this is apparently not just about it being red you know blood but somehow this destruction came probably because of a, a big thing like a mountain crashed into the water and possibly yeah how would you picture this out how would that either just the ships were crushed by the mountain or the, the waves and everything that are resulted in a giant meteor hitting the water is going to create you know a third of the ships being destroyed all right so uh, so there's the first two trumpets to blow now it's time for the third trumpet solo I know I'm trying to have a little fun with the trumpets but just to remember this get this image so verse 10 and following the third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven blazing like a torch and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water the name of the star is wormwood a third of the waters became wormwood and many of the people died from the water because it had been made bitter all right um, so this thing that happens a star falls from the heavens from heaven now I don't this is where you have to realize that sometimes heaven means the great big sky and sometimes we think of heaven as God's kingdom with pearly gates and you can read this either way throughout the scriptures um, so I, I think this is just trying to say the heavens like from way up high in the sky right from space as we would call it uh, right so the, this great big star falls blazing like a torch a picture a comet or whatever I don't know if you want to picture science wise some people think the star that falls from heaven is Satan named Wormwood uh, now is it Satan or is it just showing judgment is coming again from the from heaven from the heavens to earth uh, it's up to interpretation now I did not say any interpretation is correct but people have different interpretations and we'll when when we our knowledge is fulfilled in the final coming we'll finally find out whose interpretations were the correct if any of them were right all right so but it's the name of the star is wormwood at my footnote here says wormwood is a very bitter herb associated with judgment throughout the Old Testament <laughs> we even have in one of our hymns all hail the power of Jesus name uh, and uh, there's a line in there the wormwood and the gall the wormwood and the gall <laughs> um, what an image there it's a picture of judgment uh, and so but apparently it comes throughout the Old Testament it gives a few um, citations here in my Bible but also think how this image has carried through time uh, wormwood uh, in literature people have picked up this idea of the the worm being a very bitter hopeless helpless 
gnarled inhuman thing. You've got wormwood here. And so C.S. Lewis, in the screw tape letters, one of the demons is named Wormwood. And that's the screw tape letters is screw tape writing letters to his nephew Wormwood. And then, you know, Wormwood responds back to his uncle screw tape. All right. So literature there, you know. Now, where else do we have it? We have it in, in J.R.R. Tolkien, where he has um, worm tongue, right? Worm tongue. And that was the miserable creature uh, whispering lies uh, from the evil wizard into uh, King Theoden's ears and, and deceiving the king. Worm tongue. And, and this image there is also of it's, there's no good in it. And then, okay, if you don't know where I'm going here, now then you get in J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter books, there was someone named Wormtail. Now it's a rat, like, you know, his tail's like a worm. But he was also a miserable creature with no perceived good in him uh, that uh, was just less than human in his nature and in his character and just kind of a sniveling rat. Now, if, I hope I didn't give away any of these books to you. <laughs> I don't think I gave away any great big deadline or uh, great big uh, spoiler alerts in them, but you get to see this that the worms, the worm tail, the worm tongue, the worm wood, these these continue to be an image for us of something that's just not good, wholesome, or human, right? So this star, some might see it as Satan, who's cast down. Uh, the great star that falls from heaven is Satan. Lucifer, the bearer of light, being cast out of heaven and being uh, becoming this twisted evil thing and being called Wormwood. Or, the other way to see it is that the star that falls from heaven is named Wormwood, just like in the Old Testament, this bitter herb, bitter herb, is associated with God's judgment in the Old Testament. Okay? All right. So that's the third angel with the third trumpet and and this uh, thing comes down and then what happens the waters become bitter and unhealthy right the a third of the waters become wormwood become uh, stagnant and un uh, what are the non potable is, is that what the scientific term is biological term many people die from the water because it's non potable because it had been made bitter the water's destroyed, the water system, all right? The fourth angel with the fourth trumpet, right? The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. So uh, when the fourth trumpet blows, the there are cosmological happenings and everything is bothered by the fourth trumpet you you've got the sun and the moon and stars are struck so that the light is darkened and so that even at daytime it's not as shiny and even the shininess that happens at night is not uh, as as shiny right now it puts it in terms of a third a third a third a third right a third of the sun a third of the moon, a third of the stars. Now, right, if we're going to try to be literal, we have to try to imagine how does the third of a glowing solar body fall away? You know, does, does and well, God has the power. I'm not denying that. But or, or does a chunk of the moon come away? Do all the stars in heaven, a third of them get, get wiped out? Now, I'm not saying that God could not do that. But, that is held by more of the people who are the um, historicist or futurist or dispensationalist kind of a view. And, and uh, Lutheranism has understood things, I think, more in terms of like the idealist view, I think. Uh, I would say that. And, and so that this is not necessarily representing one third instead of one half or one fourth. But that this is saying the sun was affected, the moon was affected. It's a divine judgment. Uh, he wiped out some, but not all, right? A divine judgment on the sun and the moon and the stars. Uh, so there is some sort of, and, and so that the effect is, whether it's a third or not, 
um, the effect is that there's just less light in the world, even at night, even during the day, there's less light in the world, okay? And that's the fourth angel that comes. We've got four angels with four trumpets, so that means we have five, six, uh, five, six, seven, right? Let me just do it like this. Five, six, and seven uh, coming still. Three more angels, three more trumpets, but we are down to the last verse of chapter 8. So this is where we're going to stop here. We've got through four trumpets, and chapter 8, verse 13 says, Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Cut to commercial, right? That's how the, the chapter actually uh, doesn't get to a stopping point. It, chapter 8 flows directly into chapter 9 as if the story continues. So this is a, a, a thing to remember that the chapter numbers were put in there by human editors throughout the last, um, you know, uh, 2,000 years, but they really had taken place before even Luther's time, I think. Uh, the chapter numbers uh, were in there, and I, uh, you'll have to look. Uh, you can Google it. When did the chapter numbers appear? When did the verse numbers appear? I think the verse numbers may not have appeared possibly before Martin Luther's time in the 1500s. So, uh, but anyway, so chapter 8 flows right into chapter 9, but we, but, and there, there's not really a break in the story or context because we can say that this kind of shows possibly an artificial chapter division made because the, the monks or whoever just put a chapter number there instead of someplace else. Okay? So that's where the chapter ends. And it's no big deal on when the chapter ends. But that's where we're going to stop. But what's happening? Now all these angels have been blowing their trumpets. And now an eagle cries, Whoa! Not like, Whoa, horsey! But like, Whoa! Danger! Judgment! Um, what you're about to receive is bad news and of judgment from the Lord. That's what woe means. I actually, you know, how you use words sometimes, and then you say, am I using it rightly? Someone asked me one time, what is woe? So how do you define that if you've never actually thought about the specific definition? I've always understood it to be like, oh, this is what's going to happen to you, right? All oh, you poor Pharisees, you know, all oh, you scribes and Pharisees. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gives seven woes to the scribes and Pharisees. All right. Um, so what is woe? And my first thought when I tried to make up my own definition was it's a warning word like bad times are coming. <laughs> you know, because uh, I was trying to figure out how would I say this? It's a warning of future judgment that may be imminent. And, and so and that's a good definition right there. Um, but I think in the Bible, it's a, it's a warning of judgment and destruction. I think if, if you kind of look up the definition is how they say it. So if you say, woe to you, Russia, for what you're doing to Ukraine, I don't know. That's, I'm just making it up, I, you know. Um, you know, woe to you people who behave so badly, you know. Uh, woe to you bad drivers, who knows what. Uh, you know, what you're saying is there's a judgment, there's a punishment, there's a destruction coming. Woe is not a little passing word like you, you say to your friend, you know, he, he kind of trips you at, in, in school in seventh grade, and you go, you know, I'm going to get you, man. You, you don't say, woe to you, little Billy Sanders, or something like that. You just, that you know, it, woe is a much bigger word than that. Okay? You guys are with me. All right. So, uh, here... Woe to those upon the earth at the blasts of the trumpets that are about to blow. So we've had four trumpets, and these have been bad. But now the, the eagle is crying out, You ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, these three are going to be worse. Okay, so that's where we're going to stop. Okay, certainly Revelation has good news. But certainly we can't deny that Revelation also bears 
news of judgment up, upon those who deserve, who have invited God's wrath and have refused to believe in the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. All right. So I, I don't say that with triumphalism to say, yeah, let's, you know, I'm, I rejoice in the, the defeat of the unbelievers. No, um, even God himself would rather all people come to be saved and come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. But when there, there will be a time for judgment, right? And we know that God will also be a, a judge, I mean, a, a God of justice, all right? So that's where we're going to stop. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do see here in the seven trumpets that you have said there will be uh, tough times and hard times upon the earth, and especially as judgment comes to those who are uh, rejecting you through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would use this for us to see and know uh, the way you work and how you have promised to protect all faithful believers, all believers, and, and how uh, we might continue to try to share your message with others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God's blessings on your day and your week.